So Mesh should be ready to talk on the learning rate scheduling. Then I'll follow him on the regularization or dropouts um, and we'll close the chapter. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Mesh. All right, um, if everyone's ready, can I just get um, one eye or something so we can get, get started? Yep, go ahead. Thank you, Joseph. All right, so learning rate scheduling, is, the learning rate that we input in um, is really an attempt to try to get the, our, our models to converge. And so this one simple figure here gives you a sense that, well, how do you, you want to pick a learning rate that's just right. Um, if you pick one that's a little too high for your model, then of course it, the model will just diverge. Um, you won't be able to reach that gradient descent convergence that you need it to do. If it's too small, it'll take too long. If it's too high, it's suboptimal when you plot out the loss against for each epoch. And so you want your model at each iterative epoch to potentially alter its learning rate. Um, and so the different approaches that are listed here are the five um, power scheduling, exponential, piecewise, performance, and one cycle. And the best way to look at it is do review them side by side with the code. So you can see exactly what's going on. Um, let's begin first with power scheduling, which seems to be the, the least favored uh, among the five that are listed here. And so what that does is simply um, follows what's already coded built into Keras. You assign a learning rate and it begins to decay um, at this rate where you just specify the decay. So for the SGED optimizer, um, it'll just follow this step and you can begin to see how it, it, Giron runs a model and plots it out to show you again, learning rate for, as the learning rate begins to decrease by each epoch, you can see how it begins to decrease which by itself is fine. You do want it to begin to go down as the model starts to converge and you get an accuracy here. You know, just follow along step by step and you can see how the losses begin to go down and how it reaches a certain level of accuracy after 25 epochs. And we're gonna compare our model on similar data set, running them at and comparing them up to 25 epochs and see how we get. The next, uh, the next learning rate schedule is one called exponential scheduling. And what this does is it will, you assign it where it will gradually drop the learning rate after 10 epochs and begin to decay. And so this is how, this is a simple uh, function just for a simple decay, but really you want to do it like this, where it um, this exponential decay happens gradually again after 10 epochs or so on. Um, the distinction here being, one moment, if anyone, if, jump in anybody if you notice exactly why. Um, oh, because you're going to base that on a specified decay rate. And so when you run that model, you can again see it performs in after 25 epochs at roughly the similar accuracy, but the learning rate does seem to uh, decline quite a bit faster. So in this particular case, exponential scheduling certainly seems very comparable to power scheduling, but let's continue. Um, any questions up to this point? All right, let's keep moving on. Um, he does begin to explain a little bit further with um, 
the scheduling function that he uses for exponential scheduling. Um, he goes a little further to say, well, um, if you really want to do this right, um, the right way to do it is have and define your own exponential decay callback function. And with this function, calling it, defining it here, and then setting that callback as your exponential decay over here in a particular model, that works a lot better. And you can begin to see that performs a little better, but then the loss is a bit more pronounced this time, which is exactly what you want. And he does provide some commentary that exponential decay tends to do quite well. Um, an alternative one to exponential decay, which is a simple idea, is one where now rather than doing following that exponential decay function, how about doing it in piecemeal, where you lower your your um, your function just after it, at a steady clip. So you go, you keep your learning rate at a certain level for a certain number of epochs and then drop it down after say five epochs at a time, initially five, keep it going like that for uh, at the lower level for 10 epochs and then drop it again and keep going that way. Um, in this particular example in 25 epochs, it didn't do quite as well. However, in general, um, when you, in research papers that have studied this, they found, in, per his commentary, this piecemeal uh, learning rate and the exponential one, <laughs> excuse me, uh, perform, thank you, uh, perform generally much better. Now, finally, um, one of the more better learning rate schedules is one called performance scheduling. This one, slightly interesting idea. Uh, what was the line? There? So this, for performance scheduling, he uses a very specific callback. What he defines as a reduce RO and plateau callback. And this is defined separately over here using TF Kara schedulers function. Um, this, it seems to me, certainly for me, it's a little harder to implement, but this one does seem to do a good bit better. Um, if anybody has a better understanding of this particular performance scheduling learning rate, um, please do jump in. And as you can see in this case, again, the accuracy actually is the worst of the lot so far. And finally, of course, one cycle scheduling. This is one where he says, um, in commentary, it seems, it doesn't seem to uh, pose any particular difficulty, um, but does considerably speed up performance. And so with one cycle, you want to follow, you define that a function, the exponential learning rate fu decaying function following this method that he provides and calling that does seem to work significantly better. However, this is the part that I uh, struggle to understand. Um, while he does go on later defining that one cycle class, um, and it does perform better. That plot that you saw up above, um, accuracy is much higher. It seemed to go down pretty well. This particular plot here threw me, in, threw me off entirely. I'm not exactly sure how he reached this. And then because he's plotting, this is something different. It's playing loss against a, the learning rate. Um, not, he didn't do this for the other learning rates, so it's hard for me to compare, but not 
this is the part that threw me off quite a bit with uh, with one cycle schedule. But as he provides it, here are the functions. He encourages just trying it out with different types of data sets and see how it performs. Any questions, thoughts, reactions? Well, mm -hmm. uh, what what's the goal? And so he is trying to like just find like an optimal learning rate, or like yes, of, yeah, yes, he is trying to find an optimal learning rate, but it, the learning rate is never uh, steady; it varies, and so that schedule by which the learning rate will vary. Okay, um, here are the different strategies you can try, and so okay. among all of the many strategies, whatever architecture you pick, one additional choice in addition to your overall neural network architecture is going to be when, as you try to figure out ways for your model to converge, you want to change and modify the learning rate hyperparameter. I see. And these okay. are the different methods um, from power scheduling, exponential scheduling, piecewise performance and one cycle scheduling. These are different strategies to use in order to vary that learning rate um, as your model tries to converge. And okay. this is just one of those very clever tactics. What is, and it comes clearly from research. And so these would be mathematicians and computer scientists that have spent a good part of their time looking at different models, different learning rates, focusing on that, trying to explain it, trying to craft it, and then comparing, contrasting them to see what works. Okay. May seem, to me as a layperson, it does seem a bit arbitrary. And I'd be very interested if someone, if anyone has very specific experience with these different learning rate schedules in their own work. So fit one cycle is basically what FASTIA uses, uh, which is the one cycle scheduling that is there. Uh, the 254 cell that you're seeing is very identical to what FASTIA has as their LR finder. Okay. So that itself has quite a bit of stuff which goes in there. You basically train approximately for an epoch and each mini batch, you keep increasing your learning rate. That's what you see on the x-axis. Uh, I'm talking of figure 254, yeah, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. You keep increasing your learning rate, uh, pretty much rises from something like, I think, fast AI does 10 power minus yeah. 8 to like almost 1 or 10 power 1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you keep going from one mini batch to the other mini batch, you keep increasing your LR. And you keep seeing that. Obviously, when you're at a low LR, you are improving your model, but you're not improving fast enough. And yeah. then there comes a point when your LR is too large, and that's when you start exploding. Exploding. So that's kind of a general gist. And there are a lot of other tricks which go in there about exponential moving with averages and that kind of stuff. So that's how you find what an optimum LR would be. And yeah. the strategy is pretty much that you don't pick the point which is minimum, but you pick a point which is like an order of magnitude lesser than the minimum. So that's kind of a rule of thumb that FASTI uses. Uh, moving over to like the one cycle scheduling is kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. that also has, so when you actually set your LR here, mm -hmm. you usually set only max LR and your max LR is what you would have found from your LR finder. There is, I think there should be a parameter called min LR or whatever your LR starts from. Right. And that will the be- The start like, rate. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I'll start rate. That's what he calls That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would probably be like uh, 10 times smaller or 100 times smaller. Uh, yep. So one cycle scheduling does a bunch of things that you get for like free. And like you said, it's not, though it looks like you're picking only one LR, but your model is trending 
with a changing LR. And to kind of make sense of little intuition there is that uh, when you start, you want to start slow and you keep increasing your LR. Mm -hmm. And then comes a point where you know that, okay, fine. This is, uh, uh, actually, let's backtrack a bit. When you are actually uh, increasing your LR, there's a regularization factor also that comes in that you get for free from a one cycle scheduling. And the reason there is that imagine you have a loss function and when you're with your small LRs, you probably get stuck in a valley, but then you see that your LR is actually rising. So as your LR rises, you have a chance to jump out of that valley. And so that's where the aspect of regularization that you get for free comes from a one cycle. And then once the Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Is that is that aspect of regularization coming from this notion of momentum being used? Uh, that I probably will address after this because uh, okay. that kind of is the opposite of how the LR would move. Your LR basically increases from small to big and then from mm -hmm. big to small, whereas your momentum would be exactly opposite of that. You'd start from a high momentum decreased and then increase. I'm sorry, uh, I interrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, so that kind of gives the just the I'd like, like the intuition about like why one cycle kind of works, you basically have this concept of warm up, which helps you like jump over all these obstacles and all these valleys and you kind of settle in a flat area. That's the rising part. And then comes the cool off uh, where you kind of are finding the best spot that you want to kind of land in and then they even have like a further cooling off which is which really lets you settle down and that's why you kind of probably would end up into overfitting scenarios momentum is kind of exactly the opposite and the sense that when you are increasing your lr you want to be careful and you want to be using more of your uh, new stuff so that's why with the lower momentum it basically means you're trusting your new values more than you're trusting your old values. So that's where, that's how those two kind of play a role together. Right. So, so the, uh, the cell 254, which is the one that you had uh, mentioned, Mash, um, mm -hmm. what that's doing, uh, you know, basically after what Rekil said is basically r ramping up the learning rate until it breaks. And that's what you see that plot, right? Yeah. And when the, when the learning rate breaks, that tells you what the maximum learning rate should be in your one cycle scheduler. So now you have a way of tailoring a one cycle schedule to, for your data. And then as Rekul said, so then you ramp up the learning rate, uh, the one cycle schedule then goes by ramping up the learning rate until it gets to a point short of that place where it breaks and then turning around and ramping it back down slowly. So you can think of like a sawtooth, uh, uh, a rapidly rising learning rate followed by a sl more slowly decaying learning rate. So is it over here on this on batch, he does this el if, else if, and else, where he's got some control mm -hmm. for stopping at that optimal learning rate? Yeah, that's now this is the class, but you should look down below where he calls the class, and then we'll be able to see where See here, he puts in max rate equals 0.05. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what he got from looking at that plot, you see? Aha, max rate, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very interesting. Thank you, Rick Hill and Joseph. Thank you so much. Is, is everyone basically just using this one, whatever this one cycle one scheduler cycle. now? Is is that that is, when you start a new project, is that what you just start with? And uh, it's the default for fast AI and this always gives you like better results. I mean, I've never compared with something else, so I'm not sure about that. I, I think fast AI has a, a a more evolved strategy where instead of going on a 
on a ramp and then a you know a sharp ramp and then a decrease you go on a smoothly increasing curve and then a smoothly decreasing curve i think he calls it cosine scheduling or right. something like you that you increase right? you increase linearly but when you drop off it's a cosine drop that's right yeah that's right that's right clever way just to get convergence yeah, I mean, more than convergence, that's what I think he mentions about, like, I think, super convergence. That's what Leslie Smith kind of terms that, that basically when he did his experiment, something took maybe like 10 times or 20 times longer, whereas when you use yeah. it, it's a much more faster approach of getting there. Um, do, you, do you guys know if this applies to transfer learning as well? Like for, because, you know, I, I remember reading somewhere or seeing some mention that, uh, you know, so you you, you have you're doing transfer learning, right? So somebody trained ImageNet for thousands or like hundreds right. of hours already. Mm -hmm. so first, the initial layers, you want like, a, you don't want to change so much. So you right. want to lower and then only towards the head, right. you want a higher learning rate. Uh, right. That's what that's what FastAI calls like the differential learning rates, right? So, mm -hmm. oh, uh, I mean, if you get into kind of the details, ResNet, for example, would be divided into like three parts. Like you said, like uh -huh. uh, you would have the head, you would have the body divided into two parts. Let's call it middle and like low level, which is closest to the image. Okay. And like you said, uh, the highest learning rate would be applied towards the, uh, the head. Okay. But that will still be trained using this fast, uh, I mean, one cycle idea. And then when oh, you train the middle path again, that is kind of used the same idea. And then it, when you train that, uh, yeah, isn't, is, isn't it the case that the way you get the this LR max for the body, the two parts of the body that Rekel referred to, get scaled from the max yeah. LR you get for the head? And they do like LR by ten and LR by hundred right. or something like that. Right. Is what is done. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, FastAI basically hides all that behind the, yeah. and just does it for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, very good. That's it. For the most part, that is pretty much it. And you can begin to see that um, despite the accuracy not being the very best, um, you can see how it begins to uh, decrease and the pace at which it decreases. All right, Wencheng, do you want to take us over to uh, regularizers? Yes, sure. Cool. Okay, let me start sharing. There's a great post which kind of covers the paper, I think, by uh, the ex fast AI. Uh, Selvan, um, he has a pretty well explained version of both learning rate LR finder and the uh, why you should be using like bit ones, um, the one cycle scheduler. Can you, do you mind sharing that? Yep, let me switch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, yeah, well, we can look at those figures. Yeah, that's pretty much. Yes. I think it's there, right? There's right there. Check out Silvan Google's post is there on the first there paragraph. You go. Yep. Okay. I was just looking at that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I always find this um, more intuitive than um, way more intuitive. I mean, like basically you're, you're trying to find the learning rate that gives you the steepest last decline. I mean, and, and it makes like really good intuitive sense like you want the learning rate that makes you makes your last declines the fastest period um and that's that's the range of learning rates um you should pick um so um yeah um do you want to say anything reko on this uh, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of detail, so we're probably getting away from uh, the book and moving more into fast AI stuff. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of point out is like, if you look at momentum and that, uh, has he has he pulled up the momentum figure? Also? So, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. so yeah, 
So that's kind of the one which I was talking about. Why you want mm-hmm. you do kind of the opposite thing on that. Mm-hmm. And the last part that you see, a uh, couple of things to notice is that usually you go half half the number of epochs is up and half the number of epochs is down. And I say is approximately half because you see that last part which is linearly dropping off. That is that cool down phase that you have um, on the figure on the left. And uh, yeah, that bottom after the triangle kind of drops off, you can see there's one more linear section that goes off from 350 to almost 400. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so but that's that's kind of the cool off phase. And then momentum does something exactly the opposite. And uh, the really interesting thing that I, for me, this was that the regularization aspect of it that comes in, which I kind of just kind of explained, like imagine from epochs, iterations 100 to 150, Imagine you're stuck in like a local minima. So that would be a bad region. You'd probably be overfitting. So with the high LR, you get a chance to escape that. Mm-hmm. And so that gives you that free regularization aspect. Of it. Yeah. And, and you were saying the second half um, is just trying to kind of let the model find the um, good spot to land. Right. right, right. Um, so in, global so in, optimum. Yeah. So intuitively by 200, you're pretty much in this flattish region or you're almost there where, I mean, at least locally you're in a good region and then, yeah, you cool off like that. And then like Joseph was mentioning that, that is not, act, I mean, Fastia doesn't implement that as a linear drop off. It's more of a like a cosine scheduling. Right so here. It's much more, ah, yeah, correct. Okay. It's a, a much more like gradual decay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, like when when I was doing fast AI, basically um, you just you just pick a range uh, when the when the loss uh, declines the fastest, and in this case, it's um, between um, three times ten to the power of negative two and um, uh, ten to the power uh, power of negative to two. Um, so around this. And, um, yeah, just just an interesting point there, like a point of contention between both Salvan and Jeremy was that Jeremy used to do what you're saying, pick the steepest region. Mm-hmm. And Salvan's idea was go to the minimum and then just go one order of magnitude lower. Both most of the times would end up almost in the same region, but yeah, like they both had kind of different strategies there. Mm. Interesting. I didn't know that. Cool. Cool. Um, Rakil, I have a quick question. So you yep. mentioned that uh, this has a regularizing effect, right? right? Right. So you're talking about it jumping out of local uh, yeah, plateaus? Or... Right. Yeah. Is that really regularization? You're still just trying to reduce your training loss, right? It won't uh, count as regularization, right? You're preventing overfitting, right? Like imagine if you were stuck in that uh, uh, like a, a local minima and you can't jump out of that, then that kind of is regularization, right? I, I, I see where you're coming from, but I think there's a regularization aspect to it too, right? Overfitting like basically, overfitting to... would be if you get when stuck you... in a local minima, right? Is that really overfitting? Uh... Same question. Because uh... you are still just trying to reduce your training loss, whereas in overfitting, you are not you are avoiding trying to get a very low training loss, right? <clears throat> Instead of trying it, to focus on the. It depends on the, on the uh, actually it depends on the definition of overfitting, Gautam. Because if you define overfitting as under generalization or bad generalization, then it covers that case. If you define uh, it as overfitting, then if you. But there is nothing. It has nothing to do with generalization, right? We are just trying, still trying to reduce the loss of your training data. It has nothing to do with the validation set. Well, it it does actually because the loss the loss surface is is uh, generated by is is partially due to your data. So, if your sample has lots of local minima, yeah, the training data. So, if your sample has a lot of local minimum, you don't have enough. Maybe you don't have enough training data, so your sample has a lot of local minima. And then, like Rekil said, getting stuck in one of those is overfitting because it depends on your training data. Right? Whereas if you had infinite training data or more training data, you wouldn't get stuck 
in, in that uh, minimum because the loss landscape would be different. Cool. Okay. Well, um, thank you for the discussion. And um, let's talk about regularization uh, right here. And um, um, we talked, um, it, the book talks about L1 and L2 regularization. And um, right here. So um, I thought this, this metaphor is, is quite interesting. I'm going to read it. Uh, with four parameters, I can fit an ele elephant. And with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. Um, I, I thought this, this was an interesting um, quote. Um, with thousands of parameters, you can fit the whole zoo. And deep neural networks typically have tens of thousands of parameters, sometimes even millions. This gives them an incredible amount of freedom and means they can fit a huge variety of complex data sets. But this great flexibility also makes the network prone to overfitting the training set. We need regularization. We already implemented one of the best regularization techniques in chapter 10, early stopping. Uh, moreover, even though uh, batch normalization was designed to solve the unstable gradient problems, it also acts like a pretty good regularizer. In this section, we'll examine other popular regularization techniques for neural networks, L1 and L2 regularization, dropouts, and max norm regularization. So regularization seems, in, in this definition, it just um, helps you to avoid overfitting. And um, the way how we are doing here is basically by reducing the number of neurons um, or ignoring more neurons or um, like reducing the values um, of the neurons close to zero or um, exactly equal to zero. And um, um, or setting a kind of a threshold um, a max value um, on your on your weights. Um, so, okay. So L1 and L2. You know, I think everyone is is quite familiar with L1 and L2 from um, sort of a, a regression standpoint, um, as we went through uh, that from um, I believe chapter, um, probably chapter I would say uh, two or are four, um, and we we I believe we talked about L one and L two. L two is basically um, squaring uh, with a square, and uh, so it's not is it's not exactly to zero, uh, but L one uh, it, it would push your weights um, to exactly zero, so you would have a sparse model. Um, does anyone know the exact equation of L1 and L2 in this case for neural networks? Anyone can share any resources on this? You literally just add like norm two of the weights, sum to weights, and then you're uh, just probably throw in like a, the 0 0.01 that you see inside there, that's what it's multiplied by. Uh, okay, so literally I'm multiplying by 0 0.01. So 0 0.01 times the sum squared of all the weights. I mean, you replace the square with just one if it's L1 norm or L2 norm is square. That's it. Sum square of uh, all the weights. Got it. Okay, so it's it's similar to like regression, ri yeah. rich. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, Okay, so the L2 function returns a regularizer that will be called at each step during training to compute the regularization loss. This is then added to the final loss. As you might expect, you just use um, kairos.regularizer.l1 um, if you want L1 regularization. So, you know, of course, um, Keras is very intuitive when it, when it comes to calling the functions. And if you want both L1 and L2, then it's L1 and L2. Um, okay. Anyone has any questions or comments on this? Yeah. 
before we go to dropout. Now, um, I want to ask people, because um, I don't see the regular L1 and L2 used too much. Um, and maybe I'm just ignorant. Um, and um, does anyone know one or in which cases this um, ha has been used um, for neural networks? Um, most of the um, regularization techniques I've seen have just been dropouts, batch norm. Have you seen? I, th I think L2 is a very widely used um, method. It's very effective. For, for neural networks? Yeah, and you well you can you and you can use them all together. You can use, you know, dropout and L you know and L two regularization and batch norm. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying it in different amounts and seeing which one is best for you. Got it. Wen Chang, have you seen weight decay? Yes, weight decay. Weight decay is very similar to L two. Ah, uh, okay. I think for SGD, you can literally show that both of them are exactly the same. Mm. But once you start using other optimizers, they're slightly different. So actually, when you use an optimizer like Adam or SGD or anything, uh, like they already have like a default setting, if I'm not wrong, for weight decay, which kind of does have into regularization in there. Got it. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. I've but seen weight decay a lot. Yeah. But weight decay and L2 are not exactly the same. There is a small difference between those two. So when I said that they are identical, they're not exactly the same though. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, dropout. So dropout was invented by Hinton 2012. And uh, yeah, I mean, it just seems like Hinton, um, Lacan and, and um, Benjo, these three giants just invented a lot of the best um, techniques we're that we're still using, you know, uh, even backpropagation was, um, I think, invented by him and also someone else as well. Um, so yeah, we're uh, we're still using a lot of these techniques, um, and they have st uh, stood the, the test of time. Um, cool. So, um, and uh, the definition of dropout is basically um, kind of setting up a, a probability to literally um, set your uh, neurons to be zero. And um, um, that's it. And as you can see here, you're just Xing out. And uh, these neurons would just output zero at this iteration. Um, and that's the caveat. In the next iteration, um, it's not the exact same neurons that are being dropped out. It could be some, it could be, you know, other neurons that um, you just have to match the probability um, P that you set as a hyperparameter. Um, and usually we typically set it between 10% and 50% and um, uh, close to 20 to 30% in recurrent neural nets closer to 40 to 50% in ConvNets. And um, yeah, um, pretty simple, but really powerful technique. And um, I think um, Jerome was saying, it's surprising at first that this disruptive technique works at all, but uh, then he gave a, a pretty interesting metaphor. I would, I would do love to see that being, uh, implemented or, or experimented at, at a company level. Um, I, I wouldn't mind throwing a coin uh, on whether I, I need to go to work today or not. Um, so, <laughs> um, but that's cool. And um, um, so, but another way to understand this power of dropout is to realize that a unique neural network is generated at each training step. So that, I think that's a really powerful um, idea to grasp. And since each neuron can be either present or absent, um, then there are a total of two to the power of n possible networks, where n is the total number of droppable neurons. Um, this is a 
such a huge number and it's virtually impossible for the same neural network to be sampled twice. Once you have run 10,000 training steps, you have essentially trained 10,000 different neural networks. These neural networks are obviously not independent and because they share many of their weights, but they're nevertheless all different. Um, the resulting neural network can be seen as an average and ensemble of these smaller neural networks. Um, a tip in practice, you can usually apply dropout only to the neurons in the top one to three uh, layers, excluding the upper layer. So when we talk about top, well, we're, it's really the last um, uh, last one. Um, and so the top one to three layers, really the, the last one and the last, the, th uh, the third one to the last one. Um, so um, and, and excluding the upper layer. And the way you would apply dropout would be like in the increasing order. So let's say you had 10 layers and your 10th layer is your output layer. So that's the one you would not touch, right? Mm -hmm. Then you would have, like, let's say, 9, 8, and 7. Those are the three we want to apply. Mm -hmm. You would apply to 7, you would apply 20%. To 8, you would apply 30%. To 9, you would apply 40%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is think. it, yeah, yeah, I have a question on that. Like, is it, I've seen it generally using the same kind of drop bar ratio. Yeah, that also works, right? That also, is, then there is no question about that. If you do it the other way around, if, if you do, let's say 40, 30, and 20, you're losing, you're already lost, right? 40 plus, if you do 40% dropout, that means you cannot recover that information moving forward. That's mm -hmm. why you don't want to do 40, 30, 20. 20, 30, 40 makes more sense, right? You've only lost mm -hmm. 20, you still have the rest of it. You can grab that information and then you drop 30 and then you drop 40. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, does that, like, is that used a lot using different dropout ratios? Uh, yeah, probably not. Like FastAI has a parameter where you can set it, but if you don't set it, then yeah, like you say, it's the same mm -hmm. dropout that is just yeah. used. Yeah, because I've seen I've seen mostly just using the constant dropout ratio. Yeah, um, um, in in NLP and you know where pre-trained networks, then they tweak it like the AWD network right. is mm -hmm. heavily tuned with various rates of dropout for various mm. layers because yeah. they spend yeah they spend a lot of time. So if you're training a base network which is going to be reused a lot, then you fine-tune the dropout extensively. Otherwise, you just go with a flat rate. Got it, got it. Okay, warning. Since dropout is only active during training, comparing the training loss and the validation loss can be misleading. In particular, a model may be overfitting the training set and yet have very similar training and validation losses. So make sure to evaluate the training loss without dropout. Uh, for example, yeah. after training. Wow. <laughs> I know that's... I, I, actually, I, I had a question. I, I had yeah. a question on his last statement. What does it actually mean? Or what would you do when he says, make sure to evaluate the training loss without dropout after training? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is not... Yeah, this is like... I think, I think he means... I think he means do it without without dropout to get a baseline for what the loss, for what the training loss is. I think Wait, what does the after training mean? So I think it's finished training with dropout. So let's say you had 20, 20, 20. So you finish your training, right? And now, so in this process, you would have had different neurons being dropped as you trained. Once you kind of don't have any dropout now at this point, it basically means that all the neurons are present, but they have these, uh, less uh, overfitted values in their weights. Mm -hmm. Now is where I assume he's saying like compare this training loss, uh, uh, compare your training loss at that point of time. I've also never heard this. This is the first time I'm seeing this. This is pretty. Yeah, but, when you, uh, but uh, that last thing you mentioned. So at that point, you're just running the same thing on the validation set and just looking at the training loss. Is that it? I think I think you're just predicting on the training sets. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. They're not training anymore. 
something weird with that i i don't know like you you've trained on that so still your training loss would be uh without any drop out you would compare that with a validation loss of something that you haven't seen before so i think yeah that kind of makes sense because i was still not sure about evaluated training loss without drop out i get that but it, at that point you and you pretty much just using was, different data sets which is always the case right when you're trying to do validation loss your network is the same your weights are pretty much the same you're always just trying to use a training data set versus a validation data set but i've never seen fast ai or any i've never seen that thing yeah just and also actual training means that you have completed training and then you rerun it on the entire training set that's all he's saying and look at the training loss but down would do it without drop out i guess i'm not sure yeah, see, that's where i don't understand so you're but in this case you're not training anymore you're just predicting yeah, on not training training right. yeah i think that's what that's what rekel is saying and i think he's right he's, he's saying that you this is right rekel isn't it you're saying that you just take the trained model and then you just as uh, as wenchang said you just predict on the training set yep that's what i think is means that yeah, i think that's right it, it, and when you're predicting you look at the training loss because if you're predicting then where is the loss that's you'll what confuses still, me you'll still be having an error right there so you can still predict the loss right you will still get a training loss why do you yeah. say that you won't have a training loss no no but it would just be a, whatever the loss value a single value that you get but you wouldn't actually be, when you maybe it's a detail in the code that i need to run through because when you're predicting right you're just taking the trained as you said take the trained values of the weights correct and just do a single prediction and let's say you use the training set on it right then it's a single value of the loss that you get from that or well you would predict on each um each row of data each, oh yeah each single inst instance and are you and, asking whether you would back propagate on that stage yeah I, 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 and yeah. how does the loss get calculated i guess no that's because you've already trained you've stopped yeah doing anything that's so that's what confuses me then what loss Yeah, Shrinivas is right. You are you are doing model dot predict. There is no more loss anymore. Yeah. So what loss? And that's the thing that confused me about that statement. Well, so I, as you said, we have to look at the code. Maybe it's just. Um... No, I don't think it's model dot predict in this case. Uh, Mehul, like it's more of like you are trying to still evaluate on your training set. I agree that model dot predict kind of obfuscates that step of calculating your loss. But I still think you can still calculate your loss, right? You would still get errors. and you'd kind of back propagate that which would in essence if you have to back propagate you would have the loss there right like but you wouldn't be adjusting loss. the weight no, 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 exactly loss. exactly you don't do that part that's why that is the after training part of it that he's mentioned right example after training you you don't back propagate you just run it forward forward fee forward and you get your loss so so i think i think the point is that when you run it forward you would let's say cats and dogs you'd get a bunch of predictions right now if you if you find what your error is that is not the loss though right that is just going to be let's say like an accuracy error. or something correct yeah. correct yeah. yes yeah. Right. error yes that's the that's the correct but anyway i i guess you have to that's where i i didn't look at the code to see whether he has an example of how it's implemented to figure out and uh, anyway. so so i side note oh, what, what uh, this this warning do you i i have the hard copy but the hard copy doesn't have this warning oh what's going on like they yeah have... I, i i have the same problem i'm looking for that warning and i don't see hmm. it something so pretty new published it he published yeah. it later <laughs> yeah we don't have that either um i have i have that i have a physical copy Yeah, right. And I don't have that either. That's weird. Okay, let's keep going. Um okay. If you observe that the model is overfitting, you can increase the dropout rate. Conversely, you should try decreasing the dropout rate if the model underfits the training data. It can also help to increase the dropout for large layers and reduce it for small ones. 
Um, moreover, many state of the art architecture only use dropout after the last hidden layer. I believe that's what FastAI does as well. Um, so you may want to try this if full dropout is too strong. Dropout does tend to significantly slow down convergence, um, but it usually results in much better model uh, when tuned properly. So it's generally well worth the extra time and effort. Okay. That's just a tip on the Salu. Uh, Monte Carlo dropouts, anyone has used this before? No, but it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful technique because it's very simple to implement and it gives you an uncertainty on your estimate and it makes your model more powerful because you're basically averaging together many, uh, mm -hmm. many models. And um, so you not only get a better result, um, but in other words, a better prediction, but you also get the error on your predictions because you now have an ensemble of predictions mm -hmm. um, so that just like with the random forest technique, you can, yeah. uh, you can get an uncertainty by taking the standard deviation. It's like stacking a bunch of neural network predictions together um, as an ensemble method. Why is it, um, why Monte Carlo? Why is it called Monte Carlo? Anyone has any... Answer because it's rand it's random like gambling in Monte Carlo. I mean, mm, got it. So, I mean, yeah, I mean it's 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 there, there are Monte Carlo techniques which um MCMC MC, I forget what the first MC stands for, but uh, which are heavily probabilistic. Sorry. Um, Monte Carlo simulation just means um draw, drawing, you know, drawing from some probability distribution at random. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so got So the, in this case that's the underlying technique, if you will, for because as Joseph just said, you're getting an ensemble of networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And as we can see here, we're just using numpy.stack and literally model this train equals to true. Again, we're setting this train equals to true so that the dropout layers are active for sample in range 100. And then we get 100 different predictions um, because of that dropout um, uh, being active. And then we, we average the predictions across uh, axis equals to zero, meaning across all 100 stacks of predictions uh, with, with which um, each of each of which would have uh, ten thousand by ten uh, as a shape. Um, so, okay. Um, I think that's pretty straightforward um, in terms of you know um, uh, writing it, uh, uh, coding it, and um, and as you can see, he was comparing. Okay, so if we don't have dropout, which is model.predict, and it has 0 0.99 uh, for the probability of class nine. And, but if we, if we do it um, with dropout, now um, when dropout is activated, now um, this has 0 0.68 for the first instance so the probability um, is lower and the model is less confident. It tells a different story. Apparently when we activate dropout, the model is not sure anymore. It still seems to prefer class nine, which is this, but sometimes it hesitates with class five, which is um, zero, one, two, three, four, five, which is this. And set, uh, number seven, yes. So 0 0.14 and 0 0.17 are very close because class five is Sendo, class seven is Sneaker. And, but once we average over the first dimension, meaning doing this y prob is dot mean axis equals to zero, we get the following MC dropout predictions. 
which is now, okay, 0 0.22, 0 0.16, and 0 0.62. The model still thinks the image belongs to class nine, but only with 62% of confidence, which is, seems much more reasonable than 99%. Plus it's useful to know exactly which other classes it thinks are likely. And you can also look at the standard deviation of probability estimates. Apparently there's quite a lot of variance in the probability estimates. Again, we're, we're doing st STD standard deviation across hundred predictions of all 10,000 by 10 um, matrix, each of the value. Um, so doing like hundred of, uh, hundred of them averaging, sorry, doing standard deviation across hundred values. And um, and there's some variance. It's a lot of variance. If you were building a risk sensitivity system, you should probably treat such an uncertain prediction with extreme caution. You definitely would not treat it like a 99% confident prediction. Moreover, the model's pr prediction uh, model's accuracy got a small boost from 86.8 to 86.9. And the hundreds sample or hundred predictions stacked together is a hyperparameter you can tweak. The higher it is, the more accurate the predictions and their uncertainty estimates will be. However, if you double it, inference time will also be doubled. So jo your job is to find the right trade-off between latency and accuracy, depending on your application. Um, MC dropouts, I, I understood this was just overwritten, overriding uh, the call function of this, this class, but I, I didn't understand why this is MC dropouts simply by setting this to be true. Yeah, that was confusing for Rekula and I too. And what it actually seems to be saying is the reverse of what, if you just look at the flag setting, it would mean. It means keep dropout during inference. And you do that by setting training equal true, which is kind of bass backwards, but that's the way it is. Maybe because the flag values were already set in some ways. So train, by setting the training equal true, what you're actually telling MC uh, the network to do is to retain dropout during inference as well. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, then you get the effect of continuing to drop out, which means every network, then you get this ensemble of networks effect. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's why Got you it. said the training equal true flag, which is kind of counterintuitive why you would set it. it. I wish it were inference equal true or something like that, but it's the opposite of what you think it would be. But the effect it has is to make dropout be active, not just in training, but also in inference. But that's not yeah. what the flag settings uh, would seem to imply, but that's the detail. It's unfortunately the opposite of what you think it is. Yeah, yeah. So, so that when you actually do inference, you're essentially having all kinds of different models, right? Like if you have 100, you have 100 different models because of dropout being true, being active. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That, that, I guess that is the MC dropout and I don't know what it stands for uh, MC, but um, it is what it is. And uh, no, no, MC is Monte Carlo. Oh, it, it is Monte Carlo, okay. Got it, okay. Oh, right here. Got it, okay. MC, I like that, especially one place you can use it is, uh, let's say you train it on cats and dogs and you throw it a monkey, if, because you're using like a, softmax at the end, it's going to still predict whether it's a cat or a dog, right? So MC dropout can be used basically in a situation like that where you want to predict an unknown class. It's hard to train the network for an unknown image. But if you do drop MC dropout at inference, 
and your model is predicting cat dog cat dog and you have this huge standard deviation or variance is high you can then be suspicious about the output that you're kind of generating so it's a great way to predict unknown classes mm. okay cool thank you Michael. okay so max norm regularization uh, wait, wait. Before we move on to a max yeah. norm, I'd, I'd just like to throw this comment out there because every time I go over, uh, every time I review the dropout method, it just, it, the parallels with uh, the random forest, uh, with the techniques in the random forest just jump out. Like, mm. for example, um, you know, you are, you're setting weights, you're setting weights of, of neurons equal to zero at random. Um, it's very similar to the bagging technique and the, uh, wh where you, uh, where you take bootstrap samples, where you randomly throw away some of the samples, uh, you know, and the other part is where you, uh, at every node, you use a subsample of the features to predict. So that means you throw away mm -hmm. some of the features you could be using for prediction mm -hmm. uh, every time. It it's very similar in in uh, to me uh, to, the, uh, to the dropout concept. Cool. Yeah, I, I do. Very much agree. It's a good analogy. Cool. Are right. anyone else has any comments? Okay. So max norm regularization. Um, this is norm, um, and it's it's basically the Euclidean distance, uh, Euclidean norm or the length of your vector. Um, and it's basically just square everything and take a square uh, and sum it and square root of it. And uh, so, so calculating that uh, um, smaller or equal to R and R is the hyperparameter that you set. Um, and um, um, this is, I mean, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's almost like weight clipping uh, instead of grading clipping, but um, it's almost like weight clipping. Yep, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, reducing R increases the amount of regularization and helps reducing overfitting, um, meaning you, your W is even smaller. The, um, and uh, max norm regularization can also help alleviate the unstable gradient problems uh, if you're not using batch normalization. To implement that, um, you just set the kernel constraint argument of each uh, hidden layer to a max norm uh, constraint with appropriate max value. And uh, in this case, one point, uh, it's one. And, um, after each training iteration, the model's fit method will call the uh, object returned by max norm. Okay, um, I think I wanna kind of just quickly go through the summary and practical guidelines because I feel like it's, it's helpful. Uh, I know it's, it's almost time, it's 11.33, and, um, but we're, we're, almost, we're almost there and quickly. Um, so, here are the um, all the techniques that we kind of went through, uh, the configurations, and uh, um, and he himself, um, Jerron, has found uh, th this configuration table um, to work fine in most cases without requiring much hyperparameter tuning. That said, please do not consider these defaults as hard rules. And uh, so when you initialize, you use HUD initialization, activation function, LU. Um, and uh, normalization, none if shallow, batch norm if deep. Um, I'm, some, I'm surprised that he didn't do, um, he didn't say ReLU or leaky ReLU. Um, but I guess LU works very well for him as well. Um, regularization, early stopping, uh, plus L2 regularization if needed. Optimizer, 
uh, momentum optimization um, or a misprop or an atom. Um, learning rate schedule, one cycle. Okay. And if the network is simple stack of, of dense layers, then it can self normalize. You should use the configuration 11 4. Uh, kernel initializer, uh, Lacan initialization. And I think ResNet uses Kyming initialization. Um, and I think that's kind of the standard for many computer vision techniques. Um, so maybe keep that in mind. I think the, ki the Kyming initialization is designed for uh, networks that use ReLUs. ReLUs, OK. Yeah, Got whereas it. the, the Galoro initialization is designed for networks that use, I think, uh, sigmoids or tanch functions for, um, for yeah. the activation. Got it. Got I'm it. Uh, the guy's name. So her initialization and Kyming initialization are the same thing. Oh, OK. Yeah, of course. Kyming, uh, yeah. Oh, I, Interesting, because I've just been used to Kaiming initialization. But... I guess his name was Kaiming He. So. Right. <laughs> OK. OK. Well, great. OK. So, so that is the case. Great. Good to know that. Cool. Um, and um, so um, if it's a simple stack of dense layers, we use Salu. Uh, no normalization um, or self normalization. Alpha dropouts if needed for regularization, optimizer, uh, momentum optimization, and uh, one cycle. So these couple ones are the same. Don't forget to normalize your input features. Well, I guess, you know, we, we do that through batch norm, right? I guess you didn't mention it here. Because um, if you if you use batch norm, you don't have to normalize your input features. Does fast AI use these configurations by default? Um, for her initialization, yes. But Relu, but, but Relu I believe is that um, default activation function. Okay. Um, not LU. One cycle, yes, but a different version of one cycle. Atom is default, um, not momentum optimization or arm is prop. Uh, I don't think it uses L2, but it uses weight decay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, normalize it. Batch norm, yes, batch norm here. Yeah, so um, you should also try to use reuse parts of a pre trained neural network if, you know, that's, that's, that's a transfer learning, and I, I, I feel like that's that's definitely the future. Um, because when the when a lot of uh, the models get bigger and bigger, um, and and the bigger tech companies did the you know kind of paved the way, uh, paved the roads for a lot of you know individuals like us or smaller companies. Then when we have more specialized data sets, um, then we can just fine tune uh, using uh, pre-trained neural networks. Um, just a point there. Yeah. That when you end up using a pre-trained model, you want to normalize your features the same way that pre-trained model's data was normalized. Mm. You don't want to do batch norm there. I've never seen batch norm being used. I know Jaron does mention that you can use batch norm towards the input for normalizing, but especially if you're using something like a pre trained network, you want to use that mean and that standard deviation to normalize your data and not try to batch normal. Got it, got it. Okay. Anyone else? And I thought this was interesting as well. Um, like if you want to, um, if you want it really fast, um, fold the batch norm into the previous layer and possibly use just uh, ReLU or Leaky ReLU. And um, this was interesting. Um, just literally changing your flow position from 32 bits to eight bits. So in, instead of using, you know, tensor, 32 bits tensor, or, um, sorry, uh, NumPy to floats, and um, you just change it to like eight bits. 
and uh, so that it will save, um, it will make make your model run faster. And um, so, so mentioned there, like, there are two things over there, right? Like you can make it sixteen bit and train, which will make training faster. Mm -hmm. There is something where you can train on thirty two bit, and then once you get your final weights, just convert that to sixteen bits. Mm. So that's what like. I do that for like, if I'm deploying on a phone, I would train on 32 bit because it's a hassle depending on whether you have like in a uh, GPU with support 16 bit and stuff like that. Uh, and then when you finally get your output weights, just convert that from 32 bit to 16 bit and then you use that. That again, kind of, again, helps the generalization, right? That's another thing that you get for free there. When you, that's interesting, when you were saying you just convert it back for use case that you just said. What was that use case again? Uh, like when you're deploying on, like, I think he's also said, right? Mobile, right. like Raspberry Pi, yeah. iOS, that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh-huh. And, so and is, that, is that supposed to work better for, like, mobile applications? I don't see a loss of accuracy that much. It's way faster. Imagine instead of deploying, like, a 50 MB model, just dropping from 32 to 60 and you're making your model 25 MB, right? So you're saving on space. Uh, imagine uh, like a lot of device, a lot of these phone devices. When you download an app, you need to download this whole package along with it, right? So uh -huh. the lower the weight on that, the faster the download. So it's like lowering sure. the latency for the user and helps and all that kind of stuff. So right, it is obviously there's a trade-off between accuracy. You can extend this, right? You can go from 16 bit, you can drop it down to 8 bit. Mm -hmm. But then yeah, you, you, you then you you really see the uh, side effects of uh, of good course. Performance, so kind yeah. of yeah and um cool so so um and that's pretty much it i think every we pretty much cover everything this was a very important chapter i i, I um definitely feel so uh throughout my my journey of learning um deep learning and um in in the next chapter, this was, I, I feel like it's, it's also very important, custom models, being able to kind of custom your own models and train with it is also um, quite important. So I'll cover this chapter as well, um, you know, for chapter 12. And um, yeah, so that's that. Anyone else has another comments or? Quickly jumping back to our previous discussion about drop yep. where we were wondering about example during training that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. That note, uh, though I haven't seen that, but I think it kind of like how that would work uh, is you would train with dropout and you would have no dropout. You'd finally finish training. You have your model. Now there is no dropout. You run your training set through that. You would get a bunch of predictions. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, and then we said we can calculate accuracy, right? So we calculated mm -hmm. accuracy of how you were right and wrong. But at the same time, you can just pass that to cross entropy or any other form of loss and you would get a loss value back. Right, exactly. So yeah. it, that's what I, I thought. I think that makes yeah. sense, yeah. I don't know yeah. what, what, what the meaning of that completely, like why you would do that and why not evaluate on the fly. I don't understand that part. Well, not evaluating on the fly is because the... Um, uh, it was because that warning, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That that part I don't understand, and I've not seen that. It, it's because it, you might be overfitting, um, and it might be misleading. And I see that. I, I I guess I didn't mention this. Um, I actually see that a lot on Fast AI's model, and I was, um, it, I was very baffled about why the training loss um, and validation loss um, acted very weirdly and it was misleading and I couldn't figure out why and, and now I kind of understand um, maybe it's because of dropouts. Well, one way to think about it is, and I'm not sure this explains it, but one way to think about it is that if you go on the fly, if you're looking at the loss on the fly, each step, the loss is computed with a different network that's generated by dropout, right? So 
it's going to be noisy, right? I mean, every step you're going to get a different, you know, you're going to, mm -hmm. you're going to be using a different network to generate the loss. So in that way, it sort of makes sense to wait till the end and then use the one final network to compute a loss function. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And, and is valid when we calculate, when we, when we calculate validation loss, that's with dropout being like in, um, inactive, right? Yes. Yes. And so, so, so you want apples to apples uh, comparison and you know, I think that's exactly one Chang. I think that's right. Yeah. Cause, cause you're using that final trained network when you calculate the, the, uh, the validation loss. So it does make sense to use the same network when you calculate the training loss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's 1145 and I want to just um, thank everyone for joining the session has been a very, very productive uh, session with lots of great discussion. And thank you, Joseph, uh, Raquel, uh, uh, Srinivas, Gotham, um, uh, for all the wonderful discussion. And, and thank you, Mash, as well, for co hosting this se session with me. Very much appreciate it again. And um, um, so have a good night, guys. Really appreciate it. Sorry, Joseph, why do you say that the model won't be the same if you were training on fly? Well, every step when you when you do when you're doing dropout every step you are calculating the loss from a different network be because the one the set on that network itself though right pardon uh, so uh, so let's say we start training we have dropout we would drop certain uh, neurons and you would calculate the training loss the same yeah. network is being used to calculate the validation loss too right no, because when you're doing training on the fly, each time you get a loss, each time you calculate the loss, you're using that particular network that was obtained from that dropout step. Correct. Correct. Right. And so, and so, from step to step, you're using a different network every time you evaluate the loss function. Correct. But I'm saying that the training loss and the validation loss eval evaluated at one step will be on that same dropped out network, right? The network doesn't change within the calculation of training and validation. In yes, it does, because you don't, you, you don't, you, when you value, when you use the, when you evaluate the validation loss, you are using the final trained network. Uh, no, on the fly, you won't be doing that, right? Yeah, because, because oh. you're going to train your model and then you're going to, when you finish training the model, then you're going to evaluate it on the, on the validation examples. No, as you're training, you'd look at the validation loss too, right? I think, uh, Rekil, when, when you are calculating the loss on validation set, you would set training equal to false, right? So all the dropouts will be switched off. Yeah. Definitely. It's, Whereas, you're not yeah. in training phase. In you're... Yeah, go on. Uh, so you're saying that's how the network will be different between in training versus validation. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like when Chang said to get a fair comparison, you would calculate the training loss by setting train equal to false. Mm, correct. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Like in PyTorch, we would always, when we go into value, we always yeah. do model.eval. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's switch off. Yeah. You're right. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Great. Awesome. Um, we're glad. I'm glad that we cleared that up. Um, great. Thank you, Rekio. Thank you.